So my name is Miosh Kudarek. Uh, I've been with Gravity for around three and a half years, more or less, but with the people who are working Gravity for much longer. Uh, we've been working different companies. At Gravity, I'm solution architect, uh, what they call me, uh, working with Mongo since probably, I know, 2015, more or less. Um, and today I want to talk a bit about getting started with Mongo. So this is, this is level zero, so people who have no chance to work with Mongo or have limited knowledge about Mongo will go through, uh, through very basics and hopefully we will learn something here. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to talk a bit about Gravity, who we are. Uh, we are essentially a software house. We're building products, we design products, we are starting our journey in artificial intelligence to, to get into that world, so we are supporting our products with AI. Uh, and we also focusing on application modernization, which is a very buzzword, but in essence we move data from place A to B to something modern and then take your old app and we build it, usually from scratch. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, why to work with us? We have plenty of open roles right now, so you can look at our website to see if something suits you. But basically we focus on very small teams. Most of, uh, most of our projects are very small, up to a few people, and average experience I would say is between 10 and 12 years uh, per person in the company. So, so we, we believe that small and uh, very experienced teams, they actually solve the problem. Uh, how does it look? We are spun across the world. It looks really beautiful here that we are here and there and there. Uh, the main development center is in Poland. We are in Gdańsk, Krakow, Warsaw, Wrocław, and there are even a few people in Poznań. Uh, however, our offices are only in Krakow, Wrocław, and Gdańsk. Uh, we have over 12 people at this moment. This is a bit outdated in, in, in Colombia, in Medellin, and several people spun across different time zones. Uh, to support development, sales, and, and marketing. Um, the clients, there is a lot of clients. I've just put some names here. Uh, the logos, uh, their build work, of course, uh, are properly to, to the companies that, that we work with. Uh, but all you see here is actually moving, using MongoDB to move data from different sources to one operational data layer or single view. Uh, and the other aspect is the bigger customers. Uh, from that I can name, for example, American Homes, which you can actually see how the website looks, what it does. It's a, it's a platform for rental homes in the US. Um, so without further ado, I want to start with questions because if you have any questions regarding anything I'm saying, let's not wait till the end. Just raise your hand, I will stop, I will ask you and explain and, and, and help answer your questions. So there will be time on the end. Yes, Jacek. Do you hire only full stack people or, or backend developers are fine? Depends on the time, right? Uh, at, the at the moment, uh, in Colombia, we're looking only for backend developers. Okay. In Poland, mainly full stack because it's easier to have person with versatile skills. Okay. Yeah. So, what we'll talk about here. Uh, today, in general, we'll start with some vocabulary. Then we'll talk about indices or indexes, depending from where you're from and how did you learn your English. Uh, uh, we'll talk about basic truth and aggregation. Then I will open a browser and try to set up Atlas, which is not really true because it's pre-set up, but I will show you how to do it. Uh, and then hopefully I will use my uh, coding skills uh, to show you a really simple app to, to start a reactive development with Mongo and to show you how easy it's actually to build something working from scratch. Um, so where we are? Well, what, what is MongoDB actually? Right? It's, it, it's a database, but what is a database? Well, it's a way to store things in the structured matter, as simple as that. Um, however, this one is no SQL database, and probably, I'm assuming, most of you had been doing some work with relational databases, and they differ from no SQL data databases by there are no rows, there are no columns, with asterisk hill because there are column no skill databases and there are no relationships in general. So here in MongoDB we are storing something like document, db, documents 
Uh, there are different types of NoSQL databases, like key value pair, there are document DB graph uh, databases, and even column NoSQL databases. But document, the MongoDB is a document database. What does it mean? Let's imagine you have a drawer, and in the drawer you have files. So each file is a document in the drawer, and the drawer is a collection. So collection is like a drawer or a presentation of a ta table in regular SQL. So collection, inside you have documents. Documents, for the simplicity, let's call there are simple JSONs. They are stored in a bit different format, but we can think about the document, just any JSON you would like to have there. There are some limits on the sizing, but again, not the purpose of that. So another one, schema. Mm. So there is this concept of no schema at all. Like you can do whatever you want in a document database, a Mongo database. You can put anything you want unless if it is a JSON. The issue here is like, what does it mean that there is no schema, right? So you have to write a software on top of it to use it. So how do you know if there is a field in the database you want to read? You have to know about it, that there is a name or there is a surname or there is an address in the database. If you don't know it, then how you can fetch it? So there is always some sort of schema, but in the same collection, you have documents, we have different, different schemas, different, they, they look different. One document can have only name, the second document in that schema can have name, surname, address. The third one can talk about weather. They can be in the same collection. Does it make sense? Not always, but you can expand it without having these collections defined. Like if you look at the at regular relational database, you have to define the column has an ID. This column is a name. This column has something. And if you want to add fourth column, you have to redefine the, the table definition. Then probably you have to fix the data, and then you can add something new. Here you don't need to do that. However, there are options to actually put a schema on top of collection to, to put some structure on your definition of the document. Collections. As we said, collections are like tables. Um, however, we can have a different types. It's not only necessarily collection, but different constructs, like views and materialized views. This is also something the regular relational database like Oracle, MySQL, they actually have it. The view is something dynamic. You can define a query, and this query will be run in the background, and you can query the query as per se, treating it as a, as a table, in that case, in the collection. Or you can have a materialized view, which is essentially an execution of query on the collection, which creates different collection, which you have to refresh from time to time and then use it as a regular collection. There's option to have capped collections. It's, it's a fixed size collection. The size can be either size of the collection, either amount of documents, or it can be also TTL, which means like there is something older than I know two years, you can remove it. So it's out of the box. Uh, that's how capped worked. And there are time series collections which help you to uh, store data efficiently based on the timestamps. So for example, B-Tempora databases, when you have a row that, I mean a row, a document which is valid from a timestamp to a timestamp, another from timestamp to timestamp, or something like market data where actually it's stored based on the timestamps, uh, it's more, more, much more efficient to use it this time. Uh, performance, like Mongo is fast, but it's fast only when you use proper index, indexes. And the key here is, how you apply those indexes is very important because it's crafted towards use case. The same data can be used differently by you and differently by you. And even for your case, the indexes will be different than for you, even the data is the same. So Mongo provides a whole set of indices, simple one, like index on the name. So if you want to look for something based on the field called name in the database, that's how you can, can, can do it. You can search based on set of fields, like name, surname, and age, if this is inside the document. Uh, this will also work. However, the order how you create the index is quite important. 
because if you have an index which is called first field, first, first part of index is name, second is surname, and if you start using the query, find me someone with the surname Skudlarek, this index will not be used because only will be used in the, the, the order the index was created. So you would have to create another index, the single field index, or surname. So in that case, you will have two. Multi-kill in, uh, indexes, this is something when you have an array in the document, like regular JSON array. Uh, and this is something that for every array input, there will be a separate key inside the storage. So these are very big indexes usually, but they help you to navigate around uh, searching inside arrays. Text indexes, again, if you have a field which has a very long string, you can, you can index it as text and search inside it. Uh, that's an interesting one. As I mentioned, there is no schema. So sometimes uh, you don't know what you want to index, what fields you can index, because they are not yet there. An example would be, let's say you're storing metadata about something in the document. And at the moment of defining what it is, you had like five or four fields there. So at this moment, you could create an index on those four fields inside the metadata object. However, later on, you decide to add another metadata item, another, 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 and that would mean that you have to update your indexes constantly. If you use a wildcat index, you can just say, hey, anything which is under that metadata key, if there is even complex structure, you can use wildcat index there just to, to, be, to be safe for the future. Uh, multiple different ones, like hashed indexes, which are you know, few fields together, hashed to one value, and you can use it to search multiple values, geo indexes, loca localization, and something like 2D indexes, like on the, on the two-dimensional pane. So, okay, we have a basics, we have a collection, the collection has indexes, we have documents, but now how to insert that document? So, uh, these are examples exactly from Mongo University. I recommend it if you want to to get deeper knowledge how the things works. Um, however, this is a very basic thing. You have database, you have collection users, and there is a very simple command insert one. And there is a JSON document. That's it, you execute it, it ends up in the, in the collection. The only thing will be added here by MongoDB, it, there will be an ID. So each document must have an ID, and this, in this case it will be auto-generated by the collection and the index by default will be also created on ID. Read operation. So, oh, it should be in different order, sorry. So, regular select on top, select something, select top five name and addresses for, from users table where age is bigger than 18, right? So, the same case in MongoDB query, you can use you can define users as a collection. On the top you have users table, below users, users collection. There is find, which is equal to select. And then you have a condition, age greater than 18. And you want to only search for name and address. And then you limit the rest by five. That's it. So basically every, all the conditions you want to have will be inside find. And in that example of the SQL query, it will be on the where clause. clause. Uh, Updating, quite similar. Uh, you can have also a condition based on which you want to update and then what kind of fields you want to set. At this moment, we will, for example, set status to reject when someone is under 18. Delete, nothing really special. Delete many condition, it deletes. So it's, it's, it's extremely simple to, to do CRUD operations uh, in Mongo. Okay, I have here Atlas setup, but I won't do it because I pre-set up it. I learned it the hard way. It usually takes up to 10, 15 minutes to, to provision the new cluster. So I already have a cluster, but I will show you how to do it uh, after I discuss the aggregation framework. Uh, and the power of, of Mongo is not only that you can do CRUD operations, you can do a basically on any web database. Uh, here the power comes from aggregation framework. This is a topic which we could cover like two or three hours discuss the different aspects of aggregation framework. 
but in essence, it's a set of steps you want to do during your building your query. So first you can, uh, the very simple example here, like you have some data, you can match them that they, for example, have Wi-Fi, and then you want to just project parts of the information you found with Wi-Fi. You can do exactly the same thing using regular, uh, regular find. Find me all the amenities which, uh, which have Wi-Fi, and the, the green part is what parts of the document you want to see as an output. So there is, this is not aggregation framework, this is just regular select, as we can say. Uh, however, you can use this the same with the aggregation framework, using the match operation and then projection. So you may ask, why do you want to do it with the aggregate if I can do it with find? The aggregation, this is just an example. You can have multiple steps here. So next step after match, you could do, I don't know, count average of the price. You can join with different collection if you want. If you want, right? Uh, you can do unlimited amount of stages here. So with one query, you can achieve the results you are not able to do with find. An example of that would be uh, a match with grouping. So first match something like match to particular condition, and then as you can see, you can group based on particular fields, and here you will get grouping based on very simple images of squares, triangles. How, how does it look? So in that examples, I'm adding a group stage. So find me all the, the properties which have Wi-Fi, and tell me in which city we have the most of them. So we are grouping by city, and we're just counting them. Okay, coding. That was fast, 18 minutes. Okay. I thought you will have questions, but it's, it's uh, quite quiet time. So uh, now what we have to do, we want to set up Atlas, which hopefully we'll manage to do. What was your estimation? It took you. It was like 25 minutes. Uh, not that bad. So. What is Atlas? What is Atlas? Yes, that's, that's what I want to show you. So Atlas, if you type in Google MongoDB Atlas, uh, you, you will get redirected to beautiful page of Atlas. But Atlas is a, is a MongoDB in cloud, basically. So you can either install your Mongo, install everything on your laptop, start it from command light and so on. You can download a Docker image, start Mongo in Docker, that's also fine. But all this uses your computer resources. You can just go to Atlas and create a free cluster there and start coding with, with minutes. So if you, if you go probably here, you will be asked to get signed, create your account. If you create account, you click, you sign in, and you go to something which will look like more or less this one. And you will have a databases. That's actually pre-set up. I'm hoping I'm logging. And you can create a new cluster. By default, it will be empty. Nothing will be there. So of course, we want to use a free one. Free is good, right? Uh, we can select the cluster tier. This is M0 Sandbox, which is a very small shared RAM across different, different servers and very small storage. But as I said, it's free, right? You can have bigger ones, but for the purpose of presentation and most of development work, to be frank, this is enough. Uh, you can name the cluster and then actually create. And I used to do it with a create button but it takes sometimes 10, 15 minutes and we would be waiting for that. So I have my cluster, cluster created here. No, I used to have it here, so get back. So this is the, the cluster created. We already have some collections. I've been playing around with it, but I will get back to that in a second. Uh, just to check if I have a set up, there's network access for the purpose of the presentation. I've set it up to allow everything. Again, I do not recommend it, but the Wi-Fi sometimes changes and I cannot connect, so basically you have to restrict access to, uh, from the IPs you are uh, intended to use. I have also users, which is probably database access. I have my user here already created, but we could just do that and create another one. Uh, of course, you can link it to your, uh, your uh, Active Directory. You can link it to some kind of permissions in your cloud environments. Many options here, probably most of, of this will work. Uh, I'm not creating user because I already have one. And the last thing, there should be database here. I already have a database. 
uh, which are pre-created. Again, I create, it will just pop in. We can click connect. I will use that in a second because now I will try to open a blank new IntelliJ. Hopefully this will work. File, new, you don't see it, but that's fine. I'll just move it. So, where is this thing? Okay. What's the, how to name it? Jump. Yeah. Okay. It's Java, let's do it Maven. I don't like Groovy. It's up to you what you like. Uh, and I want to have it as Spring initializer because I want to create a Spring app, right? So two things I need here. I need uh, Reactive Mongo, I believe. Reactive, I should put my glasses on. They're downstairs. That would be useful. Yeah, it can be Spring Reactive Web so that we have a controllers and Reactive Mongo. There you go. We just need those two dependencies, nothing else. Let's, let's hit create. And on the different screen, I have to use a new window. And there you go. There you go. We have brand new. Is it big enough or I have to make it bigger? I wish I knew how to do it bigger. Uh, there you go. Bigger. That should work. So uh, that's almost it. That's basic application. Actually, it should start, I believe. Just, you know, tries to make. There you go. It doesn't work. Lovely. What do you have it? Okay, Mongo driver. Lovely. Because I included, uh, I included dependencies to Mongo, so it automatically tries to connect to Mongo. And this is the, 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 the place where I want to use, actually, a bit of properties. So, uh, the properties for Mongo, they look actually like that. We need URI and how to get it from. So, we are going back to the browser. And in the browser, we can have connect, we can do whatever, we can do Compass, for example. Compass is actually a standalone tool you can install on your computer and just, just a browser, browser database. I will show it in a second. Actually, I can show it right now. So, Compass is, is a tool like that. So, you can actually browse your database, go through your collections uh, and see what's happening there. I will be playing with it later, so just, just bear with me. Uh, so, here we already have a string. I can copy and paste it, or like that. Uh, but as you can see, the password is not displayed here. I have my secret password, which I obviously I will show you because it will change in a second. Cluster is free, nothing is on database, so if it leaks, it leaks, sorry. Uh, so I will copy this from, and now I have to, of course. So I'm here, and that's my, password. Uh, one more thing I need to do here is actually to specify what database I can have. Because as you know, we create a cluster, but under the same cluster, you can have multiple databases. So, and multiple, and each database can have multiple collections. So by default, Spring will have no idea which database to use. So it will probably fail. Haven't tested it. So I just need to specify the database name. So that's it. So once we have properties, let's kick it off again. Should be green. Yes, we have it running. Nothing is happening, right? But we can connect to Mongo at this moment. So what's the next step? Hmm, let's think. We said we want to have something reactive, right? So let's enable, enable reactive Mongo repositories. This will help us to actually uh, look for reactive Mongo repository uh, instances and create them. Uh, we'll create them in a second. So what's we want next? We want to have a simple controller. So again, I could use shortcuts, but I don't know shortcuts on the Mac, so I'm using mouse. Uh, another thing, if I'm clicking what I'm doing, it's better to, to, to see that I'm clicking something and something is happening than just magically <laughs> pressing buttons and something appears. So let's get it a uh, user controller. So we have a controller. What do we need as a controller? This will be a REST controller, probably. Glasses, Miho glasses. And we need some uh, request mapping, right? Request mapping. Yes, and we'll do it as, for example, users. 
users. Something like that should work, right? So that's almost it. What else? I mentioned we need a reactive repository. What does it mean? So let's create something that will actually access the database. Oh, it should be interfaced. Uh, it doesn't matter, actually. So interface, and let's do it. Uh, uh, reactive repo. There you go. So I'll just copy paste here because I don't really want to type this long string, but essentially the Mongo driver from Spring Boot, I mean Spring Boot, provides us an option. You can tell us what is Mongo driver. You could tell us what is Mongo driver. That's true. Uh, so Mongo driver is, <laughs> that's a good one, it's a good one. Uh, so it helps you to communicate with the database without, uh, without you writing a lot of code in principle. But uh, what Spring gives us, it gives us something called reactive Mongo repository. Uh, uh, this is essentially something which helps you to, to do very basic operations like listing, getting items, uh, deleting items, and you don't need to do to provide any kind of operations here. So actually this will work as is, as you can see there is a user here. So what is user? Because we want to have actually a class user, not this one. I want to create a new class. No? So I need to do it this way. User. Hard way, yes, user. User will be our document. So this is what we'll be storing in Side a collection. We don't know yet what collection, but let's do document. This is for sure MongoDB mapping, yes, document. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to use a collection here. Small collection, and the collection might be, I already have the collection users, so we will do collection users two. Very good name, right? Uh, users two. Serious in my glasses. So that collection will be called users. We don't ha we haven't created anything in the database yet. It's it's only through uh, through through our IntelliJ. And now what what our user will have? It will have ID, which will be string. Uh, and by default, uh, if the field name is ID, it will be mapped to ID field in the database. What we can do here, we can provide uh, some name let's say, and something else, I don't know, let's do version, apply that long version, version of the document, version, brilliant. So version will annotate your version, so it is version every single time we, we, we update this document, uh, the name, let's do it non null, just like that. And what else do we need to have? We need to have a constructor, because it has to be created. Again, I'm clicking, as you can see. Train constructor, and we just need a name there, okay? And what else? We need getters, because uh, if we want to serialize back to, the, to send it to the, uh, to the browser, we need to have those getters for the serialization purposes. So let's just, just getters and create all of them. I think that should be it. So now if we get back to our reactive repository, we have a user here. And that's almost it. Going back to controller, let's, let's try to get something from the database. Um, hold on, where is mine? So, um, public, public, what we want to have. We actually want to have Flux. Flux, who is familiar with Flux? No one, even you, Yashik. No, no. <laughs> cool. So, I have a question. Why yes. have you chosen the reactive way instead of? Uh, because I thought it would be cool. I've never done yeah. reactive things, so okay. I thought it would be cool, right? Uh, you, you can do non reactive way, so you can read the but Flux is the way that it will open a socket, and socket will be constantly open with browser, and new things will be del continuously delivered to you. Okay. So, this is a Flux, is a structure which helps you with that, and the Flux will be the Flux and use user. Yes. So, yes, of course, it's not there. Why it should be? Why it's not there? Mm 
Why it's not there? That's interesting. <laughs> I've just imported it. So let's do this way. As always. Oh, there you go. Well, I know why. Okay, get users. Uh, what else we need? We, we need actually nothing here. We have get users and what we are, oh, we need to have our private, uh, what is called the user repository, yeah. reactive repo. Reactive repo, that's it. And it had reactive repo, that's it. Cool. All right. Obviously. Okay, and now we can generate a constructor from it because we need one. Obviously, different order. So it's really weird to use that laptop with the keyboard. I'm using without keyboard at home, so. Uh, what do we need here? So, <laughs> so we have our reactive repo. Uh, this reactive repo, we can get, uh, we can do something which is uh, find all. There you go. And that's almost it. Where's mouse? Uh, but as you can see, we had only an interface here, like just interface. But the find all will be auto generated. We know the user, we know the ID type. So this means our controller will just auto generate it. Right? We have to use, of course, return here. That's it. And for purpose of this, we will just do something magical. We'll do delay element elements all the duration of seconds one. Why, is, why are we doing that? Because I want to show you that the things are being returned as we go to the browsers. They are not like immediately all the documents are there. So uh, if we had like million documents here, uh, if we approach non-reactive way, we would try to get everything from the database in one blob, it would be sent to the, to the database, I mean to the, to the browser, if you don't know that. And this, it will be every single package with the data which comes to, uh, to uh, to the Spring um, uh, Spring service, it will just be so served to the, uh, the browser. And there is one more magical thing. This is this is just our get mapping, which I will just paste here. Come on, there you go. So this means that we are actually streaming. We have to provide that to, to the Spring. I think that should be it. So let's see if it starts. Hopefully. No tests? Of course, like who would test? Like, come on. Yeah. Okay, something's happening. So let's let's go to users. Uh, users, I already have it here, let's see. Yay, there is nothing, cool. <laughs> but it works. So just to show you that it works and that we have something, let's do a small change. Let's remove the users. And let's use the table I already have. Why I know that I have this table? Because if we look here, and if we click Browse Collections, you can see we'll have probably two collections, users, and there is some data here, right? So if we go back, we have it users. Let's, let's click Stop, and let's play again. I could click Let's Start, obviously. Is it stopping? Yeah, it's there. And now we should actually see some data coming in. I'm hoping, yes. But this is actually in database. And the question is how to insert data, right? This is constantly being streamed, right? Yay, something is there. Uh, <laughs> without glasses, without glasses, right? <laughs> Uh, so one more thing we could do, we could actually try something else. We could try to post some data. So let's do public save. Uh, let's do it, what we can say for like, we can do mono, first user, what is mono? Mono is the same as, as flux, but only ex expects one thing in return. And then it closes the uh, stream. Where is mouse? Yeah, mono. Why well, it's not here? Yeah, there is mono. And we want to have save user. We want to provide some string name. Name, and that's almost it. What we want to do, we want to return this reactive repo. 
and what we want to do here save save entity we will do new user from name that's almost it uh, we want to have this as a path variable maybe let's do it like a request body request body who is familiar with request body probably everyone no yeah so it will just take whatever's in the body and put this into the name and we want to have this as post mapping and do we need anything else here uh, and we need just exactly the same thing as here just to indicate that results will be will be a stream in this case is mono so stream of one so we're almost there uh, so restart yes stop and rerun and the last magic is it up cool let's double check if it still works Yes, it still works. We have Alex and some Johns. Let's see, it's still open. So let's, in the meantime, let's use, I think I should have Postman somewhere here. Yeah, it's on different screen, obviously. So this is a very simple post. We have John, uh, let's make a name here. <laughs> Your first throw, you asked two questions. <laughs> it's on you. So basically you can send it and hopefully it will get created. Yeah, there is. It will get the response it's created. And if we get back to our database, as you can see, it's not loaded here because when it finished and closed the stream, Yashik was not there. Now, if you refresh, come on. Well, there we Yashik. No? Yes. <laughs> so, um, and, and you can, of course, expand this user to, to anything else. You can just, just add an item here. Let's call it private uh, string. String, other name. Right. Brilliant. And, of course, let's generate a getter for that. To, we can see it. Generate getter. Yes. So I've, I've changed nothing. I added other name. I haven't touched the database. I haven't touched the collection. I had no change any schemas. I've just added a name. Uh, just for sake of this exercise, I just want to be a quick. So uh, there's other name, right? And let's just default it to something, right? There you go. And we start again. Is it restarting? Yeah, it is. Lovely. Let's try to create a record again. Like now, oh, yeah, so there's. Let's do another one. It's supposed to be created. You can see the name is also there. And if we go back to the database and we refresh that, we will hopefully, after 10 seconds, we'll have other name is already predefined here for everything you return, but in the database it won't be because I predefined it. Uh, and if we look into compass, which I showed you, where is the compass? Compass. Yes. So in the compass, we can browse that data, right? Uh, no. Where's refresh button? There is no refresh. Fine. Okay. No? Okay, there is Yashik. And as you can see in the Yashik, we haven't had this other name, but we have it in other. And why it appears in the browser? Because I initialize this is with the constructor, it's always there. So it won't be fetched from database, technically. It's my mistake. But anyway, it's, it's here. You can see it in the same collection, has everything. Do I want it to show anything else? Uh, the, the compass itself. You can use the queries here. Uh, recently, they introduced something which is called some AI stuff. So I can have find me a document with name Alex. Oh, uh. <laughs> Thank you. So in principle, it should actually generate me a query there that will find an Alex, and you can have some aggregate different queries, but apparently, uh, we are unable to process your query, but uh, 
Uh, yes. So uh, don't need uh, uh, Java or something else to operate on data. You can. No, you you can you can usually use it. Like you can even add data here, like in the in the visual, like you import just try JSON. It again, maybe for well, try to close it again maybe and open. Find the name Alex and try to restart your computer. Uh, uh, I, I think this is this is issue with uh, with the AI services, right? Because something very new it has been introduced in, in Compass 4.0, and since 4.0 we already had a few updates there, and well, no, it doesn't it still works. Like, yeah, sorry, like, it could be cool too. But yes, you can browse the documents here. You can just 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 use it like. Uh, I have two questions at this point. Go on. Uh, so one question is, well, all of this is pretty nice. But that's basically what every document database does. Yes. So how uh, it? I don't quite want to ask better, but how it's better, or what features it may have that we should be interested in long ago. And second question will be about versioning of database, because as I understand we can enforce certain schema. We will may enforce that mm -hmm. the name is required mm -hmm. for each document, otherwise it will not okay. be allowed. So how we then version database when you know because usually in production processes we have different uh, environments like you know development, test, production, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So how we then can keep this versioning in library database. Okay. So let, let's start for the first one. How it's different. Uh, that's the question I've been answering multiple times depending on versus what database we use. We have, of course, CosmoDB, we have also Amazon DocumentDB, and to be frank, on, on Surface, you can do everything as it is in Mongo, like most of the things. However, when you start to look deeper, uh, and I don't want to be negative about Amazon or CosmoDB, it's just they are different slightly. The, way of, for example, scaling in Mongo, it works differently than in an Amazon DB. As, as far I remember recently as compared, the scaling down is now not automatic there. Scaling down in MongoDB is automatic. So once you have reached, for example, I know, 80-90% uh, of CPU, it will scale up to the different higher cluster in Mongo automatically. The same thing will happen in, in Amazon uh, database. Once your load goes lower, MongoDB will scale down automatically. Based on my recent knowledge, you, could, you should do some manual actions on Amazon DB. The fact that other databases like CosmoDB or, or Amazon DB, they support Mongo syntax, it gives you an idea that that should mean something. So you can easy swap to a different database with the same set of surface feature, but um, it, it's a topic for completely different conversation because we would have to go from step by step uh, to get that. I'm happy to, to, to talk about it off the record <laughs> uh, to do that. Uh, about the versioning, uh, that's another topic for completely different presentation. The next series here, it's the next step of presentation I have prepared, is about uh, Mongo data patterns. So in the relational databases, you usually have this is a user, and you link it to, I know, to addresses, and you have address there, and you have all this relationship, maybe all up databases, and things like that. Uh, in MongoDB, depending on your need, you use different pattern to actually use your data. You can embed data together, you can embed parts of data, you can pre-compute data when you insult it. And one of the patterns is versioning pattern. The versioning pattern is based on the version, which, which I actually have here. You can use that version field to indicate which schema to which version should be applied. So on, on, on surface level. So you can define your schema that this schema applies to this version of the document. If you have a higher version. So this is not optimistic locking. So this is for optimistic locking, but you can define the separate version field. Okay. Okay. Like okay. This, this is, uh, yeah, exactly. Optimistic locking. There was a question, is this optimistic locking? Um, okay, I, I should rephrase your question because I answered a question and no one heard it. So <laughs> I just answered. So first question of, of Robert was to, what's the difference between this MongoDB and other NoSQL databases? And the second was about if you have multiple uh, environments and your document version changes, document schema changes, how you can maintain it by enforcing, still enforcing the schema. So um, document versioning pattern, we can go on 
I don't have yet a presentation about it, but it's the, the goal of the next one. Um, what else? Like, I open it to questions because there is nothing else to show. We can, uh, off the record, we can play with the database, we can write some queries, we can, we can see uh, what else it can do. Uh, I think that's it. Go on. Uh, so I'm, my question is, uh, like when we are using MongoDB and when classical uh, SQL. So if, if you are setting up new app, like, mm -hmm. uh, what is the what are the things you make you decide which one to use? Okay, I might be a bit biased because uh, I like to work with Mongo. It's extremely simple to set up, uh, but from my perspective, when you uh, need when you have a deep need of relationships and you cannot avoid them. Uh, that's when you, when you go to relational database. If you don't need them or you can work around them. So for example, you can merge things together and store it as one document and it's still within the Mongo limits. Why not to go with Mongo? Uh, the other one is, um, it was true several years ago that uh, MongoDB and some other databases that were not handling uh, transactions. At this moment, that's no longer an argument, argument because they do handle transactions, they do handle transactions across multiple shards, transactions across multiple clusters, so and even multiple collections. So uh, at this moment, I don't even know if I ever use relational database, but that just, just from my experience. It's just, I don't see a point of defining tables, defining columns, uh, working on maintaining it. Of course, you can have, I know, Liquibase or uh, uh, how does it called in, in .NET, like you create uh, the database based on, uh, on, on the fly. Um, anyway, Liquibase in, in, uh, in Java. So you can create those schemas by, uh, by the code. But again, I haven't used relational databases for probably 12 years. But isn't it that uh... When, when you have schema, you actually have forced to, uh, the structure is enforced, versus here it's optional. It's, it's optional, yes. So, so you leave your code uh, basically up to deciding whether, whether some fields are going to be there or not. So. Uh, that, that, that's true, but you can make it, you can enforce schema here. So you have this option to leave it open on enforcing in MongoDB, right? In, in a SQL database, you don't have that option to leave it open, right? The, the extension of rel relational database is much harder. It's kind of like static typing. Kind of, Strong yes. Typing. Strong typing, yes, mm -hmm. indeed. Is your presentation something else? No, that's actually, actually it, so. I have a question about the uh, connection to users so. with um, address or something like this. Uh, if you want the connection uh, between the user and address, do you need to provide it in one JSON? It's uh, all stored in one record? Or so so th that's a part of the question from the Mongo uh, data patterns, but it depends on the use case. So um, imagine you have uh, something simple. Well, let, let's go with that example, right? Uh, you have a screen on which you display users, right? And if on that screen you need immediately access to address of the user, you would potentially do a user and address will be embedded in the document. So it will be in a single document, right? Um, address is actually an example like the address is usually short, right? It doesn't have a lot of, it doesn't, doesn't take a lot of memory to store it in the database so you can put it together with the user. But imagine something different, like you have uh, I don't know, a, a video information or movie information and the comments about that video, right? So in that case, you wouldn't store the comments inside the same document because the comments could grow, 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 and it will be a really huge document. And do you, do you as a user, you want to see all the comments at the same time when you open the website? Like, not necessarily. You can see I don't know, one comment, maybe top three comments or something like that, but why to see all of them? So you design the database to the use case. So if your requirements show me this video and some comments about it, so then you can do things like you have a document with description of the video, with details of the video, you have 10 top comments embedded there, 
So when user enters a website, it will get that information immediately, but then he clicks a button, load more, more, more comments, and then you go to separate collection to load those comments, right? So it always defined by the use case and the user what he wants. If you want fast access to the document, then embed it. If you don't need it, split it. If, if the data is bigger than you, uh, then your limit of, I believe, 16 megabytes of a document, then you still have to split it. So always based on the use case. Okay, and if you split it, do you need some foreign key? Well? No, there is no foreign key. There is nothing like that. You, the, the only connectivity between them is in, in how do you want to use it. There, you cannot enforce connectivity between collections. There is no like uh, referential integrity. There is no con such concepts as, as that. Right, so essentially you would either uh, connect to a different collection and say, take me all the comments based for, on that video, or you could use aggregation framework, which would uh, join those collections together and output you. But you cannot enforce this. Uh, this, how, this. How is joining uh, Extremely simple. So you know that the video, video has an ID of a five, for example, right? So you specify, well, it's loosely. loosely coupled. So, yeah. so essentially, you can either select only comments with video ID 5, so you can have separate query. But if you want to join it, so you specify join me on that field and that field here. That, that's it, even there is no physical reference. So in SQL, you can also select from two tables which have no foreign keys or no connectivity, just, just like that. Million queries in complex queries, that's the question. How, this, how fast it will working? Uh, okay, million records. Uh, I would start asking questions. How big are the records? Do you need rec do you need million records? Can you please? So I would ask, do you actually need million records right now to select with your query? Um, but, not, but not all records, but last, uh, last records. Uh, okay, so if you're talking about million, there is just no difference. So how it works, uh, every single index, uh, is indexes are stored in RAM memory. So your query will access RAM memory, which is fast access, then it will figure out where, from where exactly to take the data. And on top of that, if you're asking for, so if you're asking on a portion of the information, and that portion information is already part of the index, we won't even look into the, 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 the hard storage, right? It will be read from the memory. If you need more data, then it will be connected to uh, to the disk and we'll try to use some IR to get it, but still you have all the information in the index. If this is indexed, it's fast, right? Uh, of course, there are some limits because if you have a, a, a computer like this one, like this, like, I know, one, one CPU with 300, 500 something, uh, this, this three cluster, then you won't achieve that. But by scaling, you will expand the, the RAM memory, you will expand CPU, and um, it will, Work. Well, I'm, I'm just, just thinking about different answers because the million records is not that big, but we are, if we are talking about hundreds of millions of records, right, then you have to think about usage, how you want to split this data. You can split this data across multiple shards. Shards is like partitioning in relational databases. You, you say the users from the name A to C are on that shard, from C to D on that shard, and so on. So first you partition it, so your query will only hit portion of the data, right? Um, you can also have, uh, have option to read from multiple nodes or replica sets at the same time. So that could be another option. The other one uh, is, is actually back to proper indexing. That's... Can we use MongoDB for analytic queries? Uh, yes, there is, so um, if you, have a regular single instance of MongoDB, usually you have replica sets. Replica sets are like copies of, of the particular database or cluster, right? And assuming that we have a write concern one, which means like once you write something, you will get acknowledged only when it's written to all the replica sets, right? And you can set one of the replica sets as an analytic node which means that your analytical queries will only hit to that replica set, which will be used for this analytical purposes. The performance will not affect 
the regular cluster how it works because it will be dedicated node there. And of course, you can have several analytical node clusters, sorry, nodes, so replica sets. So yes, you can do analytical queries there. What science do help you to figure out that in this particular case it is really useful to use a no SQL line database? So, uh, are you asking about what things you have to take into consideration to use no SQL database? Yes, what can force you to use no SQL database? Uh, maybe you have a new project and you need to decide what kind of database you need to use. I think that the, the first question I would ask, uh, how well you know your data? Okay. So if your data is well structured and you exactly know relationships with the data and you know that your data probably will not change across the time or if it changes rarely, then I would consider something which is actually cheaper to use from that, that simple perspective because it will, yeah, that's, that's how it works. This, this was by money. But if your data is unknown, you are not sure how it develops, you are not sure how it will be used, like those questions will lead you to more towards NoSQL data because you have more flexibility there. Okay, so do you see um, NoSQL and MongoDB being used in software houses as yourself um, because of this unknown structure of business where you come to the client, the client doesn't know what he wants and then you go with NoSQL because you can develop it as you want as you know, opposed to enterprise ways where everything is waterfall structured. So now. Oh, yeah, <laughs> It's like political question, right? Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good one. Uh, I will come back to you on that. <laughs> no, no, I, I think that's, is it the path? Well, to, 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 to be frank, it, it's hard to answer because to, to be honest, I don't know how relational databases <laughs> recently developed what they offer since like five or six years okay. ago, right? So if I don't know that, I'm living in that small bubble of no SQL, and for me it's most mm -hmm. cases a default choice, yeah. but I don't know the answer to your question. Okay. But I, I think it's just much easier and simple to just kick off something online and just start doing and developing. Yeah, that, 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 that's my view, which is for rapid development, proof of concept, getting the first step into the client, taking their data, loading to the database and showing something. I think it's, it's faster. Although, you know, there's also the aspect of big data or data lakes and, and, and this direction, which Uh, as I understand uh, correctly, uh, MongoDB document can have uh, a lot of layers embedded one in one. Yes. And uh, do you know or, or is uh, there some uh, best practices? What is the maximum amount of layers so, for using? Okay, the question is about layers like. Uh, Let's call it a JSON object inside JSON object inside JSON. Like there, there is no limit. The only limit is the size of the document. That's the limit we'll have, right? Uh, but looking from the usage perspective, like would you really need to have like six or seven layers in the document? Is it a good design? Maybe we should move those layers to the same level. Maybe those data is not accessed together. If it's not accessed together at the same time, they should not be together, stored together. So, to answer the question, there is no limit. You can have as much as you can. And what's if, the best practice? Best practice? Uh, I, I think like two or three levels is maximum because usually it's like there's a main document, there may be a, a, a sub documents, there might be RIs, and RIs contain documents. So, main document, RIs, sub documents, that's easy also to read. If you, if you want to read the data, you look even if your database, it, it's easy to comprehend. But once you get deeper, it gets, gets complex. And that's not the point of using it to, to be complex. It's, 
it's again going back to this principle what you what you if you need this data together you store it together and usually you don't need that much data I, I think you mentioned views so example a, a query would be that I try to generate here like get me all the users with name Alex so that's a query right and what you can do you can create a view out of it and name it like users with name and it's Alex, the right? So, so, no, no. So this is like a virtual thing. So you can ask uh, this virtual concept, users with name Alex, get me everything from users with name Alex. What will happen? The query you wrote to get those user name with Alex will be executed on the real collection and it will be delivered to you. The other concept is materialized view. When you have the same query, get me all the users with name Alex, mm -hmm. and save it to a separate collection. And the separate collection will be materialized view. So then when you ask this materialized view, the query which originally selected users with Alex will not be executed. It will be stored in, on the disk. So materialized views are stored. Yes. Can you can you browse them? Can you index them? The materialized views. Uh, you can browse them. Can you index them? Yes, you can index them. It's like regular collection. Okay. okay. And is it updated manually? Automatically on every stage? Uh, no, no. So there is a concept of triggers. However, the triggers are using uh, the lambda functions. Uh, which again, so there is a change in database, there has to be lambda executed and the lambda can execute a code which will be, hey, refresh me this view. Okay. Okay. So it's a bit painful to refresh, yeah, but yeah. And if you need uh, data for relational databases, you uh, have some connectors uh, out of the box or you have to write them uh, Okay, uh, let, me, let me rephrase. So, so you are asking about if you have data in relational database yeah. and you want to move it to MongoDB, right? Uh, oh, that's, that's a tough one because it, it depends, right? Uh, there are multiple ways to move data to Mongo. For example, there is entire product. It's a free, it's open source developed by Mongo. I believe by Mongo. <laughs> it's, it's called relational migrator which can connect to your relational database and just move data to MongoDB uh, in batches, in one go, and having actually live connection. Uh, however, this, is, this works only for main core databases. If we look at something like, I don't know, DB2. Uh, if you look at DB2, this is all database. There is no relational migrator for that. This means you have to use different concepts. You have to connect to the, the, the DB2 database. Uh, you can use tools like the Bezium, the Bezium, which is something that can do that. So, so it's kind of starting point for ETL. You can load it to either a Kafka or either other topic and then use Mongo connector from Kafka to save to Mongo. But there is a lot of custom implementation for those niche databases uh, to, do, to do that. Usually you have to use a different connector to connect the data, load it, load it somewhere. At this moment, I would recommend Red Panda or, or Kafka because it's easy to load and there is a dedicated connector to Mongo. What I mean dedicated, so you can specify, hey, get me data from this topic and just save it to the, to the MongoDB. That's it, done. I, I don't need to do any coding with the Mongo connectors uh, to migrate data from the topics, but you have to load them to the topics somehow. So for some databases, it is default. Some for some, you have to do some work. But again, it's like the question is, do you really want to do that straight away? Because there is a different concept, a relationship. The data is this, this whole normalization and denormalization thing. You want to look at data and see how you want to actually store it. If you do it one to one, like what's really the point, right? Silence. Silence, I kill you, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, we, we can stay here. There is still plenty of beer, maybe some cold pizza there. Uh, 
I'm here to talk. Uh, there are a few colleagues from Gravity, like you could see them with one with only Gravity t-shirt, but who is from Gravity and you want to chat with us, so yeah. There you go. Thank you. Who was with Gravity, right? <laughs> 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 Thank you.